really pleased to have Dr. Ramandre Sen, who I met some months ago in Singapore, but is a well-known figure in uh, analysis of India. Uh, has written several books. You have all the biographical details, so I'm not going to go into them. But as we, as the election voting, vote counting finished this weekend, uh, and Rana Joy had written and said that he was going to be in town, I thought, let's not miss this opportunity to hear from him, because he is based in Singapore, uh, obviously from India originally. So he looks at, at Indian elections from a slightly different vantage point and from some slightly different issues that we might normally cover here in Washington. So it's a real good opportunity to get some fresh insights from a very well-informed and very careful observer. So here's how we run these programs for those of you who haven't been here before. As I said, this one is on the record, it is being live streamed, and um, uh, Dr. Sen will take approximately 45 or so minutes to lay out his case. He's got a PowerPoint, and I'll get out of the way so you can see it. And then we'll move to Q&A, and I will, at the Q&A or discussion point, ask you to uh, please identify yourself and your affiliation before you address a question. Uh, with that, again, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules. And Dr. Sen, thanks so much for stopping by on your trip to the U.S. to tell us what's next in the Indian elections. Everyone is kind of waiting to see both results and then, then what. Please. Uh, thanks, uh, Satu, for the very kind introduction. And uh, thanks to Sarah and Karen for arranging this talk. In fact, I was a fellow, a visiting fellow at the Hebrew. East West Center many years ago, uh, it seems like ages ago in 2005, when I think many the offices were also on different floors. So it's great to be back at uh, EWC. Um, so what I'll do is, as uh, Sati mentioned, I'll you know try and talk for around uh, in 30 to 40 minutes. I have a slide so that we have enough time uh, for the Q and A. Um, you know, this time is a little tricky in the sense the elections, which were incredibly long, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the politics of the duration of the Indian elections. The elections finished on Sunday, uh, that's yesterday, and then uh, the results come out uh, on, on Thursday. So, uh, you know, predicting Indian elections is perilous at the best of times. Now, you know, one wouldn't want to, you know, stick out one's uh, you know, neck and, and do any predicting, but of course, I'm happy to talk about the, the possible scenarios. Uh, what we do have are a bunch of exit polls that, that uh, uh, the results of which were released yesterday evening. So Indian electoral laws mandate that you cannot release exit poll results while the election is on. So once the final phase is over, we had a bunch of uh, election uh, exit polls of uh, various kinds. And some of them probably not too scientific, some probably with larger sample uh, sizes, etc. So we have a bunch of that. So I, in fact, uh, got an assistant of mine to, you know, uh, someone who helped me with research, uh, to do a little bit of the updating, even though I was traveling. So I have the exit poll results uh, in my slides. So I'd be very happy to talk about uh, some of the results being forecast, whether they are realistic um, or not. So, uh, you know, the Indian elections, of course, you know, many of you are, are uh, you know, of course, aware of the broad contours, uh, you know, the largest democratic exercise in the world. The numbers, as with anything in India, quite staggering. Uh, 900 million uh, registered voters, you know, 1 million polling booths, uh, a few million uh, electoral officials, again, uh, a million plus electronic voting machines. So India has gone the electronic route for several elections now, unlike in the US, where uh, different states have different uh, electoral system. Um, so I don't really want to sort of talk too much about the size, scale, etc., and the logistics of the elections, but again, I'm happy to talk about it if there are any questions. Um, but I'll just focus on, you know, I, I guess I could have focused on several different issues, but I'll just focus on, on a few issues around the, the, the campaign. Um, and one of my pet peeves is actually the, the duration of the campaign, which often people take for granted. It was uh, uh, roughly six weeks this time. So the election started off in, on April the 11th, and the results will be out this Thursday. So you can sort of gauge the, the length. Um, um, and this, uh, you know, I was thinking about this. I had thought about this earlier, but recently Indonesia had its 
elections, uh, it was not just the presidential election, but also at, uh, at, at, at the province level and local level, and they actually had it over a day. Uh, of course, I'm not comparing the size of Indonesia to India, but it's still a very complex terrain. Uh, if you sort of look at Indonesia, strung out, what, 17,000 islands, uh, east to west, 5,000 kilometers. If they could do it in one day, although that has its downside, apparently at least 300 election officials apparently died uh, from, from fatigue related issues, uh, which is uh, slightly bizarre, but that's apparently the, the official numbers. But what uh, you know, countries like Indonesia as well as Thailand have done is they've conducted the elections in a much shorter duration, but they then delay their result announcement, which I think again has its own, own set of problems. As we can see in Indonesia, even though they did it in one day, the results are actually coming out a day before the Indian election results on, on the 22nd of Wednesday, which has again led to all sorts of politics. The, the opposition parties are, have hit the streets, uh, etc. So I think uh, uh, you know, a short duration does also have its downside, but I think the duration of six weeks does have its problems, and I'll, I'll come to that. I'll do a little bit of analysis of the, the campaign, these sort of candidates uh, that were contesting the elections, the voter turnout, um, a little bit of analysis of, of what was being talked about, um, and uh, you know, finally talk a little bit about uh, uh, social media, which is increasingly playing uh, a big role uh, in the elections. Um, the results, as I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really going to talk about it in my presentation, but you know, I'm very happy to answer questions. But I'll, I'll do uh, very briefly look at the, the uh, exit poll results that were actually announced uh, on Sunday evening uh, in India, so not, not very long ago. Okay, you know, one of the things about the duration, and in India it's often taken for granted, uh, is that uh, 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 an election held over several weeks does sort of skew the, the playing field to some extent and the, the party which, which sort of can successfully uh, propagate the view that it's winning uh, actually tends to get more votes over the course of the election and you know surveys have been done on this and there's this uh, organization called the Lokmiti CSDS, the Center for Study of Developing Societies which have been in this business for a while and one of the things that they found out that for late deciders a vast majority of people who decide either during the election campaign uh, or you know, just a day or two before the election often tend to go with the party that is perceived uh, to be winning and, and that you know uh, can sort of change over this, this duration of the election and that is, is, is I would argue in, in a sense you know, introduces a, a, a different element during an election and if you look at the last election 2014 which is actually uh, this election, as I mentioned, is being held over seven phases. The last election was run over nine phases. So, in fact, uh, uh, more phases, the duration was roughly the same. And we actually saw a, a, a fairly dramatic decline in the vote share of the then uh, ruling dispensation, the, the United Progressive Alliance, led by the Indian National Congress. As you can see, it starts out you know, above 35% in the first phase, and then actually dips to almost 10% uh, by the time the last phase is held. And I'm not saying that you know, the perception that the BJP and, and then you know, Prime Minister Aspen Narendra Modi was going to win was the main reason, but it, arguably it was one of the reasons for the decline in the Congress's vote share. And you know, the results could actually have been quite different if India had had uh, you know, two or three phases. And it's difficult, I think, to uh, have a one-phase election in India. In fact, one of the reasons that the Election Commission, which is one of the uh, more trusted institutions in India, and I'll talk a little bit about the Election Commission uh, uh, later, uh, the reasons that it gives is that the logistics of holding elections in India is, is, is so challenging that you have to have a multi-phase election, and particularly the needs for the security forces to move from one part of the country to another. So that's the conventional logic that's given, but it's still, uh, one could argue that you know, a seven phase or a nine phase election is, is, is way too long. Uh, the perception of, of you know, which party might be winning is, is, is also tied to sort of you know, the coverage that a candidate or a party can get. And if you compare, if you look at the figures from 2014, you can see that Narendra Modi, uh, 
again, he, he was the Prime Minister candidate in 2014. Uh, you know, garnered the, the bulk of the, the airtime, uh, prime time airtime coverage in 2014, uh, both leading up to the election as well as during the election. And it again kept increasing over the, uh, over the course of the election. Again, uh, as you can see, the other contenders, Rahul Gandhi, who was not then the, the Congress president, who was subsequently anointed the Congress uh, president. Uh, he was then, uh, one of the, of course, the, one of the leading leaders of the uh, party. Uh, you know, his, his coverage is, is, is quite minuscule if you compare it to Modi. At the time, there was another uh, 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 politician in, in light blue, a name that might not ring a bell in, amongst this audience, a person called Arvind Kejriwal, who then, on the back of a movement against corruption, had floated a party called the Aam Admi Party or the Common Man's Party, uh, uh, which uh, at, at that time was garnering quite a bit of publicity. Subsequently, uh, the party has tailed off, although it is in, 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 in government uh, in the state of Delhi, uh, but in the rest of India, the party did not do well. But so Arvind Kejriwal actually started off in the run-up to the election as being uh, someone who was, who was getting a lot of coverage, as you can see in the sort of you know, the early March period. The elections were held over April and May 2014, as it is being done now. But then again, the coverage of Kejriwal sort of fails in comparison to Modi over the course of the election. And one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, I was talking about coverage uh, and, 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 the, the, and, and propagating the perception that a party is going to win, uh, the amount, the party with deeper pockets also uh, uh, benefits during uh, for for election that spread out uh, uh, over several weeks. And if you sort of look at the the earnings, I've just compared the the two national parties, uh, the Indian National Congress and the the BJP. You can see that um, since the BJP has been in power in 2014, uh, uh, since Prime Minister Modi took over, there has been a huge diverse divergence in 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 in, in the funds that the both parties have been able to run. And in fact, that is uh, you know, something that's sort of less noted about the Indian election is, is the, the, the enormous gap in resources, the, the campaign watches between the BJP and not just Congress, but uh, you know, because there are a host of other regional parties which I'll have occasion to refer to. And in fact, on this uh, note, one can also mention that in 2018, uh, there was something called the election bonds that were floated by the, the Indian government. Uh, it's somewhat controversial. In fact, uh, the, the, the electoral bonds have been challenged for the Supreme Court. Um, and what it did was that uh, you know, donors could buy these bonds, which uh, range from rupees 1,000 to a maximum of rupees 10 million, uh, which is called a crore in India. India has this, their own sort of a numbering system. A crore is uh, 10 million rupees, which roughly translates, I think, at current rates to exchange rates to around 142 to 143 thousand USD. Um, so these bonds, uh, 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 which were floated in 2018, and in the calendar year 2018-19, the financial, uh, not the calendar, the financial year, 95% uh, of the money <coughs> that was raised by the electoral bonds actually went to the BJP. <coughs> the rest 5% went to the Congress and the others. So again, the huge discrepancy in, 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 in the funds that were raised by the, the BJP and the other parties becomes apparent in the electoral bond system. And again, that I would argue uh, has an impact on the way parties conduct the elections, the way they can reach out, especially over an election that's conducted over uh, uh, a period of, of you know, six to seven weeks. If you look at the candidates, sort of move away from you know, the, the duration of the elections, um, you can again see that uh, you know, the proportion of candidates, uh, wealthy candidates, again, you know, the 10 million is sort of a benchmark in India because it corresponds to this, you know, the Indian system, as I said, of a crore, and there's this phrase called crore patis in India, which is in people who uh, uh, earn or have assets of 10 million rupees or more, uh, the, the proportion of uh, candidates uh, contesting, well, the candidates, again, has been on the right. I don't have you know, a, a comparative graph 
uh, from the early elections, but you will see that the, the graph is an upward one. And um, if you sort of look, and again here we get introduced to the alphabet soup that the Indian political system is. So you have all the acronyms, and I don't sort of want to go through the you know the, the, the acronyms of the regional parties. But right in the middle you have the the BJP and the INC is the Indian National Congress. You can see roughly you know the proportion of candidates for both the national parties. Uh, you know, over three quarters of them are are these. You know the the, the uh, <coughs> candidates of considerable uh, wealth, and again, as I said, this has been on the rise. Uh, the other sort of unusual thing, and I always you know, like showing this slide, is that uh, you know, candidates with criminal records uh, um, again uh, has been on the rise. This is something um, that probably was always there, but uh, we now have numbers to it. Uh, because in 2002, the Indian Supreme Court gave a ruling that all candidates uh, uh, have to file an affidavit where they have to declare their personal assets as well as whether they have a criminal record or not. So even the earlier stride, we actually really have the, the, the numbers for the assets of candidates only from 2004, um, which was the year uh, this system was put in place. Um, and um, so if you track the criminal records, again, I don't have the comparative numbers from 2004 onwards, but this too has been, uh, 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 has been showing an upward trend. The number of, of both candidates with uh, criminal records, as well as uh, elected members of parliament with kind of, uh, uh, criminal records have been on the rise. Um, and again, as you can see, most parties have a fair number of uh, fairly high proportion of candidates with criminal records. And if we compare the BJP and the Congress again in, in the middle, as you can see, there's not much of a difference in both parties, both the national parties, you know, quarter, roughly a quarter of their candidates are, uh, are criminal records. And these are criminal uh, candidates with criminal, serious criminal records. So, you know, charges like murder, manslaughter, rape, kidnapping, etc. It's not sort of minor you know, traffic arrangements or uh, in, in India it's quite common for politicians to sort of protest, street protests, etc. And then you might get slapped with a charge. But those are not the ones that are sort of being counted. Here. Are so, these charges or convictions? No, these are uh, charges. Charges. Uh, so since you raised that, now um, it's, I think, uh, it was in 2013 or 14, again subsequent to a Indian Supreme Court ruling, because the Indian Supreme Court, as some of you might be aware, is a very activist court. Uh, subsequent to Supreme Court ruling, now the rule is that if you've been convicted by any court, does not have to be the highest court, by any court, that could be a trial court, then you're automatically disqualified. If you're if you're an elected MP or a member of a legislative assembly, you get you know you have to step down and you're disqualified from uh, uh, contesting for I think it's six years. Uh, and if you are a candidate, you, you, you can't contest it. And so that's a new. Uh, uh, system that's come into place partly as a reaction to this, this uh, rising uh, number of uh, you know, people with uh, charges against them. And you're right, actually, I should have probably, you know, records probably would give an impression that they've been convicted, but these are just you know, people with charges, you know, formal charges against them. Okay, to move very quickly, you know, since I don't have too much time, I'm, you know, I'd actually you know, rather like to you know, engage you in a discussion, um, is the the voter turnout. Um, voter turnout has been sort of up and down. Uh, in the early years, not unusually so, the, the voter turnout was uh, somewhat low. Uh, but from the 60s, it has sort of regularly breached the 60% vote share. Um, there have been some fluctuations, but uh, not significant. It was only in 2014, the last election, that we actually had uh, a very significant spike in the voting. And this was, uh, as you can see from the graph, the highest ever turnout in, in, in um, independent India. And um, you know, one of the reasons people have given was that uh, the, the turnout amongst younger voters, and that's uh, a fairly large chunk of the, uh, uh, of the electorate. In fact, in this election, it's roughly estimated that of the 900 million eligible voters, around 80 to 90 million <coughs> voters were going to be first time voters. Um, and um, you know, one of the analysis of the the, the BJP's victory and the high turnout uh, in 2014 was that young voters 
turnout in significant turnout to vote in significant numbers and a majority of the vote uh, went to the BJP. Although that has been contested by some, um, you know, so that, you know, some have said though the young voters voted in greater numbers for the BJP, it was not that a majority of them uh, probably voted for the BJP. But again, we can talk about that. Um, if you sort of look out, uh, look at the you know voter turnout by the phase by phases, and again, as I mentioned right at the beginning of the six phase election, we also see that the early phases actually start out with a higher voter turnout, and it sort of tails off uh, towards you know the latter phase. And again, one could argue that this possibly could have have an impact on on the the eventual result. Um, you know, one reason could just be something very physical, like the, the intense heat. Uh, India is now pretty much in, in, in sort of worst summer months. And I was in, in the northern state of Uttar Pradesh a couple of weeks ago, and uh, in early May it was already touching, you know, 45, 46 degrees Celsius, so well over 100 degrees, uh, you know, Fahrenheit. So it's difficult not just to campaign, but also quite a challenge for you know, voters to go out and vote. So that could be one of the reasons. But again, I think you know, a multi-phase election with differential turnouts, I would argue, does again you know, have an impact on the eventual result and you know, skews the, the, the playing field uh, to, to some extent. Again, the, I haven't included the, the, uh, uh, you know, the earlier slide, the, uh, you know, the 2019 <coughs> Uh, numbers because these are still somewhat provisional. The numbers can be can change a little bit. And again, as I said, the last phase was only held yesterday, so the numbers might might subsequently uh, change. So the 2019 numbers are provisional, but um, as of now, what the numbers we have, it's not significantly different. The 2019 turnout from 2014. And again, there are you know there's been studies of you know how you know turnout impact results and there is really no uh, um, sort of uh, you know, linear sort of correlation between turnout and whether say uh, uh, incumbent government is thrown out. In fact conventional logic in India was, was that if the turnout was higher the incumbent government was more likely to be uh, elected out, voted out. But that has not always been the case and if you sort of you know go back to that Earlier slide, um, <coughs> if you sort of look at in, in 2004, the incumbent BJP government under Prime Minister Vajpayee was actually voted out, but uh, you know the voter turnout was in that year was in fact two percentage points lower than in, in in 1999. In 2014, of course, as I said, there was a spike, and the incumbent government was thrown out. Uh, but again, as I said. Uh, in long-term studies of not just the general elections but also state elections have shown that there is no direct correlation between turnout and the, the incumbent government being being voted out. <coughs> of course, there are also variations within India, and again, this was you know done by someone who's helping me uh, in, in sort of visualizing some of this data. And uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, some states uh, India has twenty-nine states. Uh, some states showed uh, a significantly higher turnout, so right smack in the middle of the country there is a fairly large state called Madhya Pradesh uh, where the turnout was significantly, almost 15% per points, per percentage points higher than, and, than last time. And we don't really know what the reasons for that spike are. These are some things that probably need to be analyzed uh, over the next uh, few weeks, months and years. Um, then again, in India, uh, there are some parts of the country which traditionally have higher turnout. So, in the east, uh, the state of West Bengal, where I come from and some in this room too come from, uh, uh, has traditionally had higher uh, voting turnout in, in the range of uh, around 80-81 percent, which is significantly higher than the, uh, uh, the national average. Uh, but then there are states which sort of the neighboring state of uh, West Bengal, Bihar, which has historically always had lower turnouts, and usually in the mid 50s, in between 55 to 60. So these are again some things that need to be sort of reckoned with the, the differential, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the variations in vote share within um, India itself. Again, there is also, uh, um, if one sort of you know, goes deeper into this analysis, there is a difference between uh, urban. And, and rural voting. In fact, 
Uh, defying conventional logic somewhat, it's the rural areas in India that uh, rural constituencies in India tend to have higher uh, voter turnout than urban areas. In fact, uh, cities like Delhi, Mumbai tend to have much lower uh, voter turnout than uh, um, you know, the, the, the more village-based or, or rural uh, constituencies in India. Okay, so to move from the turnout to uh, looking at the, the election narrative and uh, what the parties uh, campaign on. And if you sort of look at uh, and this graph, which was um, based on a survey done by one of the polling agencies, you can see that um, in economic issues and things like prices, unemployment, etc., were according to this survey, you know, top of the mind for, for voters, uh, you know, in, 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 in the lead up to the election from, from January. 2019, but subsequently, uh, as some of you are aware, uh, in, in the middle of February, there was a terrorist attack in a place called Pulwama in the Indian administered part of Kashmir. And within a couple of weeks, uh, India conducted an airstrike uh, on Pakistan, which was apparently the first time that Indian jets, fighter jets, flew into Pakistani airspace, although the whole train of events, you know, what happened, etc. is quite contested. But what we know for sure is that Indian aircraft, you know, crossed the, 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 the border for the first time since 1971, when uh, East Pakistan, you know, uh, uh, you know became Bangladesh, Bangladesh became independent uh, out of East Pakistan. So it was after, you know, several decades that you know, this sort of a strike was conducted. And this was in a place called Balakot. In Pakistan, subsequent to the the airstrike, uh, and actually, one could argue, you know, almost uh, in, in subsequent to the Pulwama attack, uh, security issues as well as uh, Pakistan became uh, a major issue uh, in the election campaign and the election narrative. You can see a significant spike in in security issues uh, as, as becoming an important issue, although it. It was still, uh, to a great extent, behind uh, uh, economic as well as, as local issues, local issues being things like you know, water, roads, electricity, etc. But you can see the spike, even though the, 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 the uh, security issues do tail off a little bit uh, from April onwards when the elections start, it still occupies uh, a, a, a significant uh, mind share amongst voters. And this is, even though, as I said, this issue seems to be tailing off, this was the issue that the BJP and Prime Minister Modi then decided to run with. Uh, I'm not saying this was the only issue, and I'll show you some numbers subsequently, that uh, the, the, there was a huge emphasis on national security and terror, which would not have happened uh, if uh, both Pulwama, the, the terror attack in Kashmir, as well as the airstrike in Balakar had not happened. And um, you can see this from the manifesto itself, although it's a bit of a joke in India that manifestos are never usually read by, by voters. Uh, it's only you know, analysts like us who probably you know, go through the manifesto. Of course, these nowadays they're put online, easy to access. But I do believe that the manifesto does set out sort of the broad guidelines of what the, the party is going to campaign on. So even though the manifesto might not be read, um, the, it, it, it does give an indication, a signal of what the, the, the campaign will be on. And if you sort of go through the, bit, the BJP manifesto, uh, the first item itself is a section called Nation First. And some of the topics or subjects under uh, that section are things like zero tolerance to, to terrorism, national security, etc. So in a sense, uh, you know, in, in the normal course of things, the manifesto probably would not have been so focused on national security. But again, because of these events, in, in February, the BJP uh, quickly turned its narrative to the issues of national security, terror, uh, and, and, and Pakistan. Again, you know, very briefly, uh, foreign policy does not uh, you know, really play a big issue in Indian elections, unless, of course, it has something to do with Pakistan. So here again, you know, the, 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 the events in February, in some senses, was a bit of a godsend uh, to the BJP. Uh, who, which is also the party that is seen to be strong on, on national security. The Congress manifesto, on the other hand, had a very strong uh, uh, welfare element, highlighted uh, 
several of the economic issues that the party felt was important, including uh, the creation of jobs. Uh, it, the party had also floated a sort of minimum income guarantee program, um, etc. So this was what the, the Congress uh, sort of decided to run with, uh, in, in the manifesto. And as I said, you know, what was mentioned in the manifesto then found uh, uh, its place in the, the campaign uh, itself. So if you sort of look at, if you analyze uh, the, 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 the speeches of uh, Prime Minister Modi, and this is for the month of March. So the elections, as I said, started off on April 11, but the, the country and Prime Minister was pretty much in campaign mode uh, from the, the, the beginning of 2019 itself, but the campaign sort of really takes off uh, 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 you know, from March, April onwards. And if you sort of look at uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi's speeches in March, you can see the defense <coughs> he occupies a line share, if you sort of look at their, you know, to do sort of a keyword analysis. Uh, of course, he's talking about other things, infrastructure, farmers, etc. But defense, security, terrorism, and even, you know, Pakistan to some extent is, is, is a part of the, the dominant uh, narrative in, in Prime Minister Modi's speeches um, beginning in March. And this changes somewhat uh, once the, 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 the elections actually start. In, in, the, in the second week of April. Uh, although, again, defense is, is fairly high up in the list of things that Prime Minister Modi is talking about, but he's also then, you know, talking about development more broadly. He's targeting, of course, the, the, his, the primary opposite, national opposition party, the Congress. And he's also talking about something called Chokidar, which is a phrase that would be uh, you know, alien to most of you. It sort of roughly translates into watchman. Or guard, and again, there's a, you know, it, it, it's, it's a somewhat of a complicated word, but uh, the narrative. Uh, you know, this was in response to a Congress campaign which has started off in in, in from 2018 onwards, uh, where uh, it said that you know the the, the chokidar or the, the the guard or the watchman of the country, i.e. Narendra Modi, uh, was actually a thief. So in, it was a kind of a nifty phrase in Hindi, chokidar chor hai. So the, 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 the guard or the watchman is actually the thief. And the BGP responded to this campaign and this uh, allegation with another sort of counter campaign called Mehvi Chokidar. I am uh, a, a, a watchman or a guard to him. And again, this sort of played out on, on social media and I'll briefly refer to that in the, in the next uh, couple of minutes where uh, this became quite a sort of popular uh, Twitter campaign uh, hashtag, and then you know, people actually uh, took on uh, the prefix of Chokidar. So all the BJP ministers, including Prime Minister, took on the prefix Chokidar or Watchman before their sort of uh, their, uh, their Twitter handle. So again, that was somewhat of a peculiar thing. Again, I'm happy to uh, talk about that if you have any questions on that particular campaign. If we sort of look at the the the, the campaigns being conducted on social media. And uh, you know, I don't have time to go into the the the, the contours of you know, the role of social media. But uh, again, happy to answer questions on that. Uh, if you look at the number of internet users in India uh, in 2013-14, when the last election was held, India roughly had you know, 300 million or so for internet users. And in 2019, the numbers actually virtually doubled. So the latest numbers of internet users in India is 600 million plus. And this huge growth in, 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 in the internet and its usage really rides on the back of, of cell phones, which have now uh, become ubiquitous in, in, in India. Um, India actually has you know, roughly around a billion cell phones. Although the percentage of smartphones is still uh, uh, you know, not that high, that, that too is increasing. And in fact, one of the reasons why both cell phone ownership, cell phones are quite cheap in India, as well as using the cell phone for various things, including consumption of news, election propaganda, etc. Is that India actually has the cheapest data plans in the world? So I think there was a BBC survey recently which uh, showed that uh, uh, it, an average Indian pays you know, roughly ten US cents for one gigabyte of data. So it's dramatically lower than. Uh, other so the, the explosion of internet, internet use, etc., really been on, you know, as I said, in cell phones as well as cheap data. 
and um, Twitter, uh, in fact, occupies you know it's it's uh, it is a somewhat of a small player you know by by Indian standards. It has I think roughly maybe eight to ten million users, which is much smaller than you know say Facebook, which has over two hundred million users, and WhatsApp, which is uh, which has uh, roughly two hundred twenty or two hundred thirty million users. In fact. You know, this current election has been dubbed by some as the WhatsApp election, and you know, one of the problems of looking at the influence of WhatsApp, besides you know we know that WhatsApp is playing a role, is that it's very difficult to research. You know, as you know, it's end-to-end -end <coughs> encryption, and you have to be sort of you know part of a WhatsApp group to really you know check on and and report you know what's sort of circulating. And people have been doing that, becoming embedded in in either sort of pro bjp groups or you know pro congress groups or you know uh, groups that are allied with regional parties but if you look at sort of the the, the situation of twitter which is um, easier to research and the data <coughs> is more open than um, say uh, whatsapp of course but uh, uh, even uh, platforms like facebook you'll see if you compare the tweets by uh, rahul gandhi the current president of the indian national congress and Prime Minister Modi from January to April, uh, you see that they are really talking about different things um, on Twitter. It's it's for Rahul Gandhi, it's jobs and and the lack of jobs that seems to be the really sort of uh, dominant topic <coughs> on, on on Twitter, uh, followed by farmers or or what is known as sort of agrarian or rural distress in India. Whereas for Prime Minister Modi, it's Broadly, a category called development. Uh, he's he's also talking about corruption, terrorism. Right in the middle is also still you know a, a fair fair number of tweets on terrorism. But uh, on on the sort of general emphasis, you can see that there is you know sort of different path that Modi and uh, Rahul Gandhi have taken in terms of, of what they're tweeting on. If you look at the party Twitter handles, not the the personal uh, Twitter handles of uh, Modi. Or and you can see that for the BGP, uh, BGP for India is the official Twitter handle. It's Modi, which is you know the, what they are pretty much you know only tweeting about. And in fact, this sort of ties into the the uh, you know general election narrative um, and uh, of of uh, you know BJP running uh, a campaign which is really presidential style, pretty much you know centered around the persona of Prime Minister Modi and in fact Prime Minister Modi himself uh, who uh, had a you know, very punishing schedule uh, during the, the election in fact both you know before the elections as well as during the elections he was roughly holding two to three uh, uh, you know, campaign you know, public meetings every day which I think someone has calculated to almost 150 you know um, uh, election uh, meetings or rallies as they're called in India uh, over the course of, of the, the election uh, and the, the, the BJP uh, in their sort of in, 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 on Twitter you know it was really you know Prime Minister Modi was all that they were talking about and in, uh, in meeting after meeting one of the things Prime Minister Modi himself said to voters was that you know when you're giving your vote to the BJP you're not giving it to the BJP but you're actually giving it to the Prime Minister. So uh, Prime Minister Modi too made no bones about the fact that it was he who was the the, uh, you know, the mascot of the, the BJP's campaign and the voters were, were really voting for him and not the party. And this is a narrative again that, um, you know, I, as I said, was briefly in, in, in Uttar Pradesh, the, the largest Indian state which sends uh, 80 members, of members to parliament to the population of over you know, 220 million. Uh, you know, in that state, you know, I, I went to, you know, it's, it's a big state, so it is difficult to gauge the mood of, of that state in a, in a brief visit. But even in some of the urban centers that I went, places like Ahmedabad, Lucknow, etc., you could, you know, some of the people that I was talking to, and I gave a couple of lectures in, in the sort of big universities that I talked to a bunch of students, uh, many of them said that they were not that happy with the BJP's performance on, on various things, and including jobs, which is one of the Sort of, sort of seen as one of the big failures of the uh, of the BJP, but many of them, in the same breath, said that they still had immense belief in in Prime Minister Modi. Uh, so there was this sort of dichotomy where they felt that the party 
uh, the, the incumbent government had not delivered, but they were still willing to put their bets on, on, on Prime Minister Modi. And of course, one of the reasons they also gave you product, then they would say that you know, there is no alternative. You know, he is, at least you know, given the current scenario, he is you know, the, the best uh, uh, person for the job. So again, you know, the, the, the emphasis both in, in, the sort of, in the social media space uh, sort of mirrored what was actually happening on the ground in terms of the, the uh, campaigning being done by the BJP was very much uh, Modi centric, as well as possibly the way voters were were perceiving the campaign. Okay, so as I said, I really end with the uh, and, and this is pretty much my last slide with the exit poll predictions, which as I said came out on, um, on Sunday evening once uh, the last phase of, of polling was over. And pretty much all the exit polls, and as I said, as I prefaced it at the beginning of the talk, you know, some of these exit polls can be quite dubious. You know, they, you know, they come out with results, but you don't really know much about the methodology that they follow. But uh, some of them are somewhat better. So, uh, for instance, the one called Access My India uh, was one of the polling agencies that had pretty much got it right uh, in 2014, and they've done reasonably well. Um, across uh, in provincial state elections between 2014 to 2019. But if you see the general trend, all the uh, uh, agencies uh, give the, the NDA. The NDA is the coalition of parties led by the BJP. So BJP is the, the fulcrum of the NDA, but there are a bunch of other smaller regional parties. And all the exit polls give the, the BJP-led alliance uh, you know, fairly clear majority. Um, if you sort of parse those numbers, you know, for the BJP itself, uh, the numbers uh, in the last election, the BJP had won 282 out of 543 is the, the total number of uh, seats. So 272 is the majority mark in the directly elected uh, lower house of parliament, which is called the Lok Sabha, the House of the People. Uh, last election, 2014, the BJP had 282, which was a majority uh, on their own. So the debate now seems to be whether, you know, the uh, what kind of numbers the BJP alone will get. And here the range is, is between uh, 240 to 290. Um, so if it's 240, of course, it's some seats short of a clear majority. If it's, about, if it's closer to 290, it's, it's, it's pretty much similar. 2014 numbers. Of course, this comes with the health warning that uh, uh, exit polls, like opinion polls, can often go wrong. Um, in fact, the sort of most famously cited case in India is for the 2004 election, where the then incumbent BJP government that were under Vajpayee was voted out. And that year, the, the exit polls had actually given the Vajpayee government, uh, the, the NDA, uh, a majority. And uh, they were proved wrong. But my sense is that, you know, individual exit polls can get it wrong. But here, since all the polls are pointing in one direction, um, you know, it looks like uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, um, that you know, one doesn't want to kind of take the suspense out of the actual election result. But, um, you know, it seems like the BJP led alliance is going to form the next government with you know, Prime Minister Modi getting a second term, but I think the debate is really going to be more about, uh, you know, what kind of numbers the BJP gets, as well as what kind of numbers the UPA, the one, the blue bar, is the alliance led by the Congress. So, as you can see again, you know, most of the exit poll numbers really give the, the, the Congress alliance a little bit over 100, around 100. Again, if you sort of break that up individually for the Congress, I think none of the uh, exit polls give the Congress more than 100 seats. So, uh, so again, you know, uh, the, 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 the uh, exit poll prediction and again what actually transpires um, on, March, on, on May 23rd will also be very significant for the future uh, of the Congress. And uh, you know, Congress was being written off in 2014, so if these numbers hold true, there will be even you know, more obituaries being written about the Congress. But uh, just to sort of recap, the last time in 2014, the Congress had won 44 seats. Um, so even if they double 
at that value, they'd still be short of 100 seats. So the Congress was probably looking at, you know, a best case scenario of you know, something close to maybe 150. That, you know, going by the exit poll predictions, uh, look 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 very distant. And the other thing is the share of the regional parties, which have also uh, played a significant role in government formation and, and national politics <coughs> since the late 80s, actually from the early 19 onwards, they too seem to have had a decline in their vote share. Again, in the first past the post Westminster system, there's often uh, uh, you know the number of seats that you get do not are not very well indicated by vote shares. You know, sometimes you can get a significant vote share, but still not win seats. So that could be the case. You know, the, the vote share might still be fairly high for both the Congress and the regional parties, but that not translate into seats. So that's really the sort of, you know, broadly the exit quote production, uh, prediction. Again, I'm very happy to talk about, you know, disaggregate some of the numbers. And again, one of the things we'll have to look out for on the, on the actual results announced is where, in which particular states, the BJP or the Congress might be getting gains. So in the last election, Uttar Pradesh, the state that I mentioned a while ago, uh, which sends 80 members to the lower house, the BJP and one of its smaller allies actually won 73 of those seats. So you can just you know, do the math and see, you know, how big a role UP played in, in, in the formation of the last government. Uh, this time they were facing a formidable alliance in Uttar Pradesh and we have to see whether you know, the numbers will fall, but to what extent the numbers for the BJP would have fallen in UP. Then the other states like West Bengal, where the BJP has traditionally been uh, not really been a force, this time around, all the exit polls are showing significant uh, increases in West Bengal, which had, uh, you know, again, some of you are aware, significant uh, for 34 years, it was actually ruled by a communist led government. So it has a sort of different history. But here, too, if the BJP makes inroads, that would be significant in terms of India's uh, domestic politics going in. So I, I don't really want to uh, have any concluding remarks. These are just some of the things that, you know, I was sort of thinking about while uh, you know, uh, drawing up this presentation, you know, you know, the duration, you know, what kind of issues resonate, whether they're sort of so-called real issues like you know, jobs, prices, agricultural uh, situation, or is it, you know, somewhat more symbolic issues like national pride, um, etc. The impact of the social media, as I said, is something that one will have to reckon with going ahead. A presidential style campaign being conducted in a very much a Westminster first party, uh, first past the post system. And finally, you know, just looking beyond elections, I think there is a tendency amongst political scientists uh, working on in India to really uh, 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 get very excited by the election. It's a huge spectacle, and we've had books recently by you know, uh, you know someone, you know, there was a book out recently by someone called Ruchi Joshi, mm -hmm. which is, you know, been selling a lot, which is this sort of you know, wide-eyed wonder at the spectacle that is the Indian election. But I think there's also need to go beyond the elections, looking at the function of uh, institutions. And you know, here I have a picture of parliament, and I've been working on parliament, parliament function for the last few years. You have the MPs protesting in front of the parliament building. In fact, the numbers for the parliament are quite damning. So, you know, we have this you know, great election, which uh, gets a lot of coverage, a lot of money spent, etc. But then the, the end result, the, the parliament it's, uh, as an institution, I think, um, is not functioning very well, along with, of course, other institutions. So these are things to think about when one sort of goes beyond the, the spectacle of, of the main elections. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was uh, really interesting as usual. I, I don't know, uh, Ranadroy mentioned earlier that he was a visiting fellow earlier a few a few years ago here at the East West Center in Washington. He wrote a book that I urge you to look up online at the East West Center publication site on the role of the Supreme Court right. uh, and the Constitution as he alluded to, a very activist Supreme Court in India. And now I'm Understanding that you're going to look at another major institution, yeah, uh, that's the, the, the Parliament, the looks of it. I'll look a couple of things. One on the uh, uh, before we open up, just uh, was reading over the weekend about the outcome of the Australian elections. So I'm always yeah. uh, conscious not to forget for the moment our own elections in the United States. Uh, 
and um, you know surprises yeah, can happen. We'll do, we'll do it. Uh, and the other thing about the, the, the number of charges, felonious charges, uh, increase of candidates, and I was thinking there was a debate here, of course, uh, about whether to give felons the right to vote. Mm -hmm. So it struck me as interesting. I don't know whether that applies in India or not. Um, but you've left us an enormous amount of uh, turf to cover. Uh, we've got about 35 minutes or so. So some of you I know came in late, so just a reminder of the ground rules. Today we are on the record. The program is being live streamed, so I would only ask that you identify yourself in your affiliation and then address to uh, our good colleague, Dr. Sen, either a comment or a question. So who would like to kick off? Jay. Hi, I'm Jay Kansara. I'm with the Hindu American Foundation. Great. And uh, so I have like a two-part question. Number one is, what do you feel is the impact, if at all, of the NRI community and whether they serve as a bellwether of the performance or of the uh, you know expectations of the government? And alongside that, it it seems that the media coverage and especially American mainstream media or English speaking mainstream media was very was not very positive towards the incumbent government. And in fact, I think the op-ed was frankly weaponized. That's my perception of it, and you, know, you can also address that if you wish. What impact does English-speaking media have on the general electorate in a, in a country where maybe English is a widely spoken language, but it may not be the most commonly spoken language in day-to-day -day life? What and, and what about regional media? How are they covering it? Because I, I, also, I can't say I followed regional media in this process. What is it, Brother Joyce? About 6%, 7% they estimate of English, uh, English language yeah. penetration on newspapers? What, I would what say is roughly, I don't, I don't have the exact numbers, yeah. but you know, by far, you know, the, the Hindi language press as well as the regional language press you know, has, has far you know, bigger you know, circulation and numbers than the English language media. Although the Times of India have actually worked for a while is now the, the highest circulating newspaper in the world. But uh, in India, the Times of India is actually way behind uh, Hindi dailies like Daini Bhaskar, Daini Jagran, etc., which really publish in, 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 in normal India. So do you want to want Please, me to sort of respond yeah, to questions? Yeah, answers? why don't we? Because right. he's got okay, a two, so. Jay's got a two-parter, complex right. two-parter, so right. why don't we? Take yeah, so on, on the NRI community, uh, I think, you know, one is, of course, NRI still don't have, you know, you can't vote, sure. uh, you know, uh, sitting outside India, which is something I think is being thought about, uh, but the logistics have not been put in place. It is, uh, I think, a significant source of, of you know, funds, I would say, uh, uh, for political parties. And I think the BJP, and uh, particularly, I think, under Prime Minister, I would say has been more successful in, in tapping into NRI funds, that could be partly because they are just, you know, the party of choice for a large number of NRIs, uh, particularly in, in in places where uh, the NRI uh, population has you know, sort of money to spare to contribute. You know, so in places like the US, UK, even you know Singapore. Singapore right? Yeah. So I think that's in, in some ways you know, there is an impact, especially in in, in, in in the funding. And I think Prime Minister Modi has also been very active, unlike earlier Prime Ministers, in sort of tapping into this resource. So, you know, <coughs> sitting here, most of you up in the Indian community would be aware of, of his uh, roadshows and you know, what he's done in, in the US in Madison Square, Madison Square Garden, which is also done in places like Wembley, in the UK, in, the, in, 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 in Australia, as well as in the Gulf. So, I think. He's reached out to the NRI community in a way that I don't think earlier Prime Ministers have done. So, so I think in that sense, uh, the BJP has fostered the, or reached out to the NRI community far more successfully than others. Um, and on the media coverage, you're right, you know, I guess you're referring to things like the, the Economist lead uh, Time, some weeks ago, and then more recently, the, the Time magazine, which ran with this cover, what was it, Divider in Chief? Yeah. With, uh, Modi on the cover, um, and then, um, yeah, the, the coverage of publications in NYT, which has not been very charitable towards either the BJP or you know, Prime Minister Modi. So I think 
you know, that, you know, the impact of that kind of coverage, I think, is somewhat minimal on I mean, India, except probably in the Twitter sphere where I think it, it, it uh, garners a lot of comment. I don't think it really has uh, much by way of impact amongst the sort of voter at large, only a certain very educated urban sort of English speaking, you know, uh, sort of voter might be. So in that sense, I don't think it has a direct impact. But you're probably also asking why the the, the coverage has been so, or that's well, not I, really. I, I, yeah. I'm just wondering, like, did it have and an I impact, think, or, or no, is I that reflective of also right. regional media based on your no, observation? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think the, the the Indian media is, you know, probably has its, its far more sort of diversified. Although one could argue that, especially in the first three years of Modi's Prime Minister Modi's term, I think he got much more favorable press than is usual. Uh, that might have changed towards the that have again you probably see a difference between the English speaking media or some English speaking media and regional language media. But um, yeah. And then on the point of NRIs, what I one point that you didn't address is that NRIs who have traveled to India to right. literally go back to their villages. Right. What impact do you think they may have had, if at right. all? Right. You know, uh, difficult to say. I think in certain parts of, of, of the country, you know, of course, NRIs are engaged in, in various sort of, you know, charitable, you know, social work activities, you know, especially this is very strong in places like Gujarat, where, you know, the huge NRI Gujarati community does go back and invest considerably in their, in the villages that they come from. So there is that bit. And they also probably come back with a certain perception uh, of, you uh, of what is happening in India, and it could be, and I'm not sure about that, that it might be a largely, or could be a largely positive one if you sort of compare that to, but that, again, that could differ amongst the but uh, you know, that could be the case again, you know, especially northern India, you know, western India, you know, these are parts of the country, I think, where the, the NRI, I think, um, are probably playing a larger role and maybe also have a more positive view of developments over the last five years or so. Who's next? Yes, Kathleen. Hi. Kathleen, David, Mr. Mr. Advisors. In 14, Mr. Modi had quite a list of goals. And um, it's evident through my reading that the, the fastest and the biggest changes came within the two plus years after his election. And I think some of his goals have, uh, how do I say? I think he, the reaching of his goals has slowed down since then. You mean economic, economic changes, re reform changes? You know, different things he promised his base. Um, what do you see going forward in that? Do you think he'll make changes for the good or kind of to hold on to his power? Yeah, I, mean, I guess it's not really an easy question to answer, but in the first Two years, I think, is also, uh, you know, that's when the governments are the most elbow room, right? Um, mm -hmm. And the government did put in place various initiative schemes, etc. Also, I think it was a bit of a sweet spot for India. You know, the, India is a huge importer of, of oil, you know, right. oil prices below. So I think the inter international environment was also conducive. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that did help, you know, the, the, the numbers for the economy, uh, you know, is now quite bitterly contested. In fact, you know, one of the things that's happened over the last year or two years is that, you know, the growth numbers, you know, the, the, the GDP, even things like the job numbers, etc. Uh, uh, earlier, Indian numbers were quite trusted. And of course, there are people from the bank, IMF, etc. here uh, who probably would know better. But uh, India's numbers were by and large, I think, were fairly credible. I think that has taken a bit of a hit I wouldn't say a bit of it, but it's taken quite a bit of a hit uh, over the last year or so when these numbers and the institutions that generate these numbers and publicize them uh, have been either subverted or being muzzled. So we now really don't know, uh, you know, what really sort of the unemployment numbers are. You know, there, uh, there was a report that was to be published by the statistical organization, the central statistical body which uh, was showing that unemployment, according to that report, that the unemployment numbers were at a historic high in India. But the government disagrees with that. And maybe because of that or for other reasons, that report 
actually has not been public, although a report, you know, a copy of the report has been you know, leaked, separated. So, um, you know, some of these things have been contested and, you know, the, the growth numbers too, you know, there's no real clarity and many economists would argue that you know, even if this government was not in place, if now the government was in place, the numbers would not have been very different. Even during the best years of the UPA, the numbers were similar or in fact better. Uh, it was only sort of at the far end of the, in the Congress led UPA government, which was, you know, 2000 and, you know, between 2012 and 2014, which the government was really hemmed in by all sorts of corruption scandals, etc. that the, 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 the numbers were. So in that sense, I think, you're right, the first two years was good. Uh, a lot of initiatives were also launched. Um, you know, I can think of various, you know, there's one called the, the Clean India, the Swachh Bharat campaign, which was a, a, a nationwide sanitation program. Again, you know, these numbers are contested, uh, but, you know, some progress was done in, in you know, the, the goal was to have a toilet in every home in India, but um, again, you know, we don't really have the final numbers for that. Then there were things like, uh, you know, gas connections, uh, gas cylinders for the poor, which was again something I would say which was quite successful, mm -hmm. uh, particularly at targeting uh, the rural voter as well as, you know, the women voter. In fact, one of the things about this election was that the gap between male and female voters is actually significantly narrowed. Uh, it's almost become the same. I think it's now probably around, uh, you know, uh, less than one, one person point. So, uh, you know, you're right. I think there was a, a momentum in the first two years which seems to have been lost in, in the latter half of, of the, 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 uh, the first term of Prime Minister Modi. Yeah. Going ahead, you know, I think it really depends on, you know, if, if, the, if, the, if the BJP has a, a clear majority, a, a comfortable majority, mm -hmm. it will have you know, room to you know, put in place reforms, put in place schemes, etc. If the numbers are, if there are more coalition partners on board, they'll of course be hemmed in by various pressures. The numbers, the kind of numbers that the exit polls are generating, of course, with the caveat that it's been proved wrong, not just in India, but we had the Australian instance recently, although, you know, Australia is a much smaller sort of, uh, so in fact, it have been, should have been easier to call, but even there, they, they erred. Uh, so with fewer uh, allies, fewer, um, less coalition pressure, I think the government will have more elbow room on these issues. But one would argue if they weren't able to sort of deliver on, on, on some of these issues when they had a clear majority, um, whether they'd be able to do it in another term is, is one issue. But again, some people say five years is too little in a place like India. So you can sort of, you know, look at both sides of the coin. But I, yeah, I don't really have a <coughs> definite view on that. You know. Just to yeah. quickly say on the parliamentary majorities, right. one thing that's changing silently in the background is the Rajya Sabha composition. Right. 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 So if you, for issues like land acquisition, where they really needed a majority of the right. joint right. session of parliament, right. Right. those numbers have been gradually changing and can be expected to change now as well. Right. So, uh, what, uh, uh, is being referred to is the you know the upper house of parliament which is indirectly elected um, so it depends on your uh, you know the number of members of parliament that you have as well as the number of members you have in the state assemblies and then there's an indirect election and you have you know. so right the Rajya Sabha composition changes uh, along with you know how well you're doing not just at the national level but also in the various state assembly elections. So the, you need a majority in both houses to push through legislation. And that was one of the obstacles that the BJP government was facing. They did not have the numbers in the upper house. Mm -hmm. So you need to have numbers in both houses. And that could change, but there's that process is somewhat slow and incremental because state elections are not held uh, together. You know, there are different cycles. So that that will probably happen over time. And again, State assembly election results are often quite different from. Them. So that's another thing, you know. The the you know state we had s some state elections before the national election where Congress was voted in. Mm. But those same states, the exit polls are predicting might actually we had been voting for you know BJP and, and Prime Minister Modi in the national election. So there's a different na different narrative that uh, you know, is spun out at, at the sort of different levels of. Miss, were you next? Do you, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, sure. Hi, yeah, this is Aditi. Uh, so, um, 
I didn't see a mention of demonetization or GST, and that was obviously the demonetization had a huge impact. Um, but I know just from friends that you know people did vote on essentially even those who were opposing Modi voted not for the impacts but also for this idea of India and there's sort of the selection in some ways the rise of kind of identity politics and people identifying with the kind of India they hope to see that was in seems to have been very much at least in reading media that seems to be um, very much a focus of this elections um, and in comparing this elections to the one up where Vajpai lost, even though he had this big ideological campaign called India Shining. They lost and everyone said this is the wisdom of the Indian water because what really matters at the end of the day is issues of like food security and livelihood and people don't care about grand ideology and grand vision. But this election seems to be actually playing into this narrative of grand vision and ideology and a narrative of what India wants to become as opposed to the real issues on the ground. Is that sort of... Because I didn't see you even mention issues of demonetization or GST right. and the issues yeah. that came up. Right. So, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, you know, demonetization for you know, some of you who don't follow India closely was something that was probably the most disruptive move by, by the government. Uh, what was it, 2016, right? right. When the stroke of midnight, uh, uh, the Prime Minister declared that uh, you know, 85 uh, 85% of India's currency would be withdrawn, um, you know, high value notes, etc. And um, you know, fresh notes would be issued. Uh, of course, you could exchange your own notes, etc. But that was a profoundly disruptive move that was initially aimed at checking uh, what is known as black money in India. Um, and then, you know, over time, the goalposts were, were shifted some, somewhat, the reason given by the government, because subsequently what happened was that all the money that was sucked out from the system, much of it actually came back. So there was, you know, so everyone was asking, scratching their head, asking what happened to the you know, black money. So obviously it, the measure did not work with regard to black money, but the narrative that the government then had uh, sort of put into play, and I was in fact uh, in India, again in Uttar Pradesh, which was having their state elections at the time. And one of the things that people were telling me, and, and this is again the distance between one might say so real bread and butter issues and somewhat more abstract, you know, national pride related issues is that many of the people who one talked to had been severely affected by the money. Of course, the middle class, etc. were just impacted by the fact that they had no cash, ATMs had huge queues, but, you know, smaller traders, people who, you know, bulk of Indians who operate on, on, on cash, their livelihoods and businesses were hit. And surprisingly, even those who had been hit were telling me that it does not matter. We are, you know, we are willing to sort of bear this current inconvenience for a greater good, which is the fight against, you know, black money, corruption, even though at that time there was no evidence which way this campaign was going. So that narrative was in place at the time when demonetization was you know, put in place. Subsequently, interestingly, demonetization has not been rarely been mentioned in the yeah. 2019 campaign by the BJP or the Prime Minister. In fact, it seems to have kind of fallen off the map. Uh, and one could argue that the opposition, uh, you know, did not probably do enough to, mm. to, to focus on sort of the disruption caused by demonetization, the impact. And there have been studies subsequently to show again you know, the, the way it impacted uh, uh, livelihoods, uh, especially uh, the rural poor farmers, again, people who really dealt. And again, if you look at the numbers subsequently, you know, one of the things that the government said that we move to the digital economy, and so that too will happen. So, so it was, it's kind of odd that what was seen as, as the most disruptive move by the government, kind of sort of, yeah. it probably goes in some ways, over the, the short-term public memory, but also the way this narrative of you know, you know, short-term pain for mm. some long-term okay, you know, yeah. idea, you know, was internalized by by people, and, and even those who felt that this was a failure, they said, you know, they, actually they tell you that you know it might have failed, but the idea was you know, good. But the surprising fact is that it was not at all part of the you know, physical campaign as well as. The, the virtual campaign. So so that was a surprising element. 
The GST again was this goods and services tax, which was put in place by the current government. You know, this was an idea that had been around for a while. Uh, again, the GST in the way it was implemented was not really a uniform goods and services tax across the country. So you had, I think, uh, at least four slabs, you know, they're trying to sort of rationalize it. So there are different rates that different goods uh, attract. Uh, again, that has had uh, a, a quite a disruptive effect, particularly on, on smaller businessmen, smaller traders who now have to do a lot more paperwork, mm -hmm. uh, etc. And these are also the traditional voters of the BJP, whom you would have thought would have yeah. probably reacted uh, uh, in, the, in the voters. And again, that does not seem to have uh, happened. So there is that sort of puzzling thing where survey after survey will tell you that people are actually the top of their mind are issues like, you know, jobs, prices, mm -hmm. uh, etc. Uh, but uh, that does not seem to be <coughs> reflected in, in, in the voting. So there are other sort of abstract notions, you know, whether it be sort of national pride, security, etc. And as you said, you know, the larger sort of idea of India. And again, I think that was one of the issues where the, the foreign press and the articles that were mentioning, I think uh, they were being critical at, on, at one level on, you know, whether the BGP government had performed and delivered. But I think the sort of the main thrust of the critique was that, uh, you know, what was seen to be an idea of India that was inclusive, multicultural, secular in, you know, I've written about secularism, it's not a sort of classically <clears throat> secular, you know, separation of church and state kind of idea that works in, that's uh, uh, been put in place in India, but secularism in the way it has evolved in India. These were ideas that have been under siege because of the various you know, incidents that we've been seeing <coughs> around issues of cow slaughter, about you know, targeting of minorities. And in fact, you know, one of the things I might mention you know, is that the last, the current parliament, which is now you know, no longer there, had the lowest share of, of Muslims ever, historically. So I think it was just 5% of the MPs in parliament were Muslims for the last parliament, despite the fact that the Muslim population is now over 14%, I think it's 14. So there, so I think you're right, you know, uh, it's an abstract idea, you know, we don't know, you know, how that influences voters. Although on the campaign trail this time, we did not see much of, you know, either Hindu nationalism in overtly or things like the, the, the temple in Ayodhya, etc. being mentioned. But I still find it puzzling, you know, why, you know, sort of bread and butter issues don't, you know, where you would have thought people are voting with their feet, mm. did not sort of get reflected. Or possibly we are still looking really at the exit poll results. We might know, not know, we might be for a surprise. And test. Sir, I think you were next. Was there anyone else who had uh, missed? Yes, yes sir. Yeah. At the end of, why don't we take these two yeah, and we will take them together, yeah. together so we can get them both in. Please. Thanks, Praveen Krishna, Johns Hopkins University. Welcome. Uh, great to see you, Ranaja and BC. Thanks for, thanks for an outstanding talk. Uh, two very quick questions on the uh, on your thesis about the duration of the election and the multi-phase yeah. aspect of the election. It was a very interesting thesis that you offered that the party with the deeper pockets probably is advantaged yeah. uh, in a kind of a longer contest. But I wondered if you could, if, does that hold as well uh, kind of in, in a situation where you have uh, regional parties emerging? Right? So if, right. if these were two national parties yeah. contesting each other, you could, you could see that one wears the other one out. But now you've got TMC coming in just at the very end, and so does, does that argument hold with equal force mm -hmm. when you have individual regional parties fighting at the different stages of the campaign against a national party? Uh, or would the national party be better served just having a kind of a quick election? That's one. Two is I was struck by um, your your slide where you, you show very clearly how the main issues, the campaign issues, changed from uh, March to April and May. And so I wondered if you could speculate on that. Why is it that these two parties, Congress and BJP in particular, uh, both with many savvy political operators advising them, I'm sure, why were the set of issues that they saw as being very compelling in March, that they pushed in March, why did they drop these and move on to rather different things in April and completely different things by May? And, and they both did that. If, if it was just one party, I would yeah. say, well, the losing party decided to yeah. change their views. Thank you, Sylvia, for moderators. 
prerogative here, just right. two finger. Um, I was struck by the emphasis you gave to this duration issue. It hadn't really occurred to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not a scientist, I'm like a scientist of Indian politics. Um, a couple of things. Um, one, is it always the case that the phases geographically are the same? Are the same states covered in phase one, two, always? Um, because you, I was, as you did it, social science, I was just thinking, what controls would you give mm -hmm. to test the proposition that this is having, that this is what's the effect mm -hmm. and the driver of the effect? Because it could be geography, it could be, I mean, if you're six weeks, lots of things change in six weeks sure. in politics. So um, I, I just want to know a little bit more about where that changed and why it didn't. Sorry, I wanted to add one to your question. question. Sir. And, I'm a group of Congressman Research. Uh, so uh, in, the, in, the, in the response to the previous uh, question uh, about the role of demonetization and, and so on, you speculated and then expressed surprise uh, that both are not uh, at the forefront, and, and therefore speculated that you know perhaps if there's these abstract notions of national pride, etc., that seem to have played a role. How much of it is that versus potentially uh, the absence of, a, of, of leadership in the opposition, uh, in your view? So, if there are no questions, I just yeah, please. Uh, those are great uh, questions. So we have first, about seven, eight minutes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Praveen's question on the you know the regional parties vis-a-vis -vis the national parties, and I showed only the slide had uh, Congress and the BJP. I would argue that the argument still holds for the regional parties because, and that sort of ties in to your question, the the duration um, of the election. It's not that you know one state is sort of done, say in the first phase. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, so for a state like West Bengal, uh, for instance, again, you know, that's just a place that I come from, more familiar with. West Bengal actually had a seven-phase election. So it started off on April 11th. I see. And finished on Sunday. I see. Okay. So in a way, uh, and these are, again, you know, speculations and, you know, people have been sort of alleging that the fact that you make a regional party, you know, also sort of campaign over that, you know, six or seven phase with far more limited resources, although they're doing it just in one state. So in that, you could argue that their costs are lower. But you're also making that party in West Bengal was a sort of target state this time. And there, you know, issues like whether the election commission is you know, really being a neutral arbiter or umpire, or, you know, th this is something again that this year, EC has been, uh, you know, one of the more trusted institutions in India as I mentioned. But this year there have been several issues being raised about the sort of thing. And one of the things that I did not mention and that I should have was that the discourse in the campaign this, uh, in, in, in the current election probably hit new lows, uh, just in terms of, you know, each party sort of getting very personal. Uh, and this is not, I'm not restricting to one party. Uh, and the election commission, uh, and there are all sorts of rules that are put in place to sort of penalize campaign, etc. This wasn't being done. So even the Prime Minister himself, as well as the principal opposition leader Rahul Gandhi, both were, you know, taking the personal route, you know, raking up issues, uh, you know, bordering on infringing. But none of them were hauled up. And in fact, one of the election commissioners actually gave a dissent on, on several occasions, which is also a, you know, a first probably. And so in that sense, the, the political discourse too was, in some ways, not really about the real issues, but often sort of, you know, diverted. So, so yeah, so short answer is that I think the duration does impact uh, the, the, uh, the regional parties. And the issue changed interesting. I think, you know, it was really the BJP and, and Prime Minister Modi who, who was sort of leading the narrative. And, you know, the opposition party was, in a way, sort of either falling for that, it was, you know, sort of taking the tack from that, and you know, changing their strategy, but not in in the, the kind of nimble way that the BJP was doing. I think the BJP, uh, you know, one of the the things that we've seen both to some extent in 2014, much more so here, is that they were able to recraft their narratives according to. So when they realized that maybe the national security issue was dying down to some extent, they were quickly able to sort of capitalize on other issues. Whereas the the opposition party, including the Congress did not stick the course 
with what they started up with, you know, things like jobs, farmer yeah. distress. These were two sort of big issues. It, I think they too sort of, you know, got sort of railroaded into, you know, what they thought were, were important issues. Right? So I think it was, you know, we were sort of following the BJP stack and that kind of explains uh, the, the, the changes. And the, um, um, so I think I kind of address you, yeah, I think that the duration aspect still needs to be looked at it probably in a bit more uh, in scientific manner, you know, uh, control, etc. But I think the broad point is that it does have an impact, I would argue, on on the result. But I think we really need to look at the, the precise kind of impact that it's having. Uh, but I think it's just now taken for granted that uh, this is the way it should be. Uh, and uh, on uh, Amit's question on on demonetization and uh, what was it specifically on? So no, all the, of these things, that issues that we consider are right, issues right, versus, right, right. and therefore the possibility that maybe the abstract notions of private, right. etc. Or is it really just the absence of uh, a no, strong yeah, leadership yeah, on yeah. the opposition? No, yeah, I, I think it, it's, 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 you're right, you know, in, in the sense that, of course, one thing was the demonetization, even the profoundly disruptive that happened, you know, almost two and a half years before the election. So in a sense, some of it uh, was, you know, the public memory shot, etc. But uh, the, the impact was real, but maybe it wasn't, it did not have a, you know, a role in, in the election. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but uh, it still remains a puzzle as to why, you know, that's what I'm speculating is why that really should not have played. But you're absolutely right. And I think if you, you know, if you move beyond surveys and you know, uh, sort of talking to people, you know, in a sort of journalistic manner, maybe, you, know, uh, you do find that narrative being very strong. Um, that uh, at the national level, uh, at the regional level, they might be voting for strong regional leaders. So there are outputs. But at the national level, uh, there seems to be a lot of voters are saying that there's really no one to, to challenge uh, Modi. And uh, Rahul Gandhi or the Congress is seen as, you know, uh, uh, second by uh, sort of long margin. So, you know, there's a acronym that's, I don't know whether it's used outside, you know, it's called the TINA factor. There is no alternative, right? So that, I think, uh, uh, is, is, I think, very much at, at, at play. In, 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 you know, it doesn't seem to be a credible national alternative. And that is something going ahead, I think, will be crucial. But on the one hand, we'll be looking at government formation. Mm -hmm. But what happens to the Congress? The more election after election they sort of stay out of power, you know, they you know, are, are sort of they could become a smaller party. Mm -hmm. Do they then rethink their leadership, which is always traditionally with the end? And so I think these are also sets of questions that we also need to look into going into. I've got two minutes, so I'm going to ask you one more question, unless there's someone. Oh, yes, Bella, our visiting fellow from right. Vietnam. Bella, please. Oh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Yeah. So, uh, now, as you are making the pace for shortening the election period, then how long do you think it should be? And right. whether, you know, the lo logistic can, you know, yeah. able, you know, will be able to accommodate a large number of voters? I can't resist saying that it's phenomenal that you think six weeks is a bit too long, <laughs> given our, our, our current uh, right. elections uh -huh. here. Oh, right, yeah. If you take it to the, the, the primary process, you know. I don't want to get into domestic yeah, but politics. I think, uh, but, uh, but I think Westminster systems in six weeks sure. is, is definitely, sure. yeah. The American system in some ways is unique, I think. Yeah. Uh, we've already started, I guess. Uh, but, uh, you, know, you know, I mean, I can't put a sort of exact duration, but I, I would argue that a two or three-phase duration, you know, a three-phase election uh, is very much possible. I think this idea that the security forces uh, have to sort of travel from you know, one part of the mm -hmm. country to another to ensure that the election is is, is free is somewhat spurious. Uh, yeah. uh, I think with electronic voting machines and a, you know a, a, a reasonable amount of security presence, elections can be conducted freely and fairly in India. So I don't think that's really an issue. So a three-phase election, I would say, given India's size, complexity. Is very much a possibility, so maybe you know conducted over you know, two weeks or so. Where I think some of these factors that I was suggesting, you know, uh, the the role of uh, you know, the deeper pockets, uh, you know, the perception of 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 you know winning parties increasing the eventually that 
those might be taken care of to some extent. I'm not saying it will be completely taken care of, but I think it will provide a somewhat of a you know, more level playing field. Yeah. So I but, think it would be very interesting study to you know study how long it should be, what's the benefits right. and the challenges. Maybe that should be my next. <laughs> Take this forward. <laughs> yeah. Who decides yeah. currently on what, what the schedule is and how, how is it determined right now? Right now, the election commission. It's really the election commission that decides it. So okay. that's the you know that's the body that's authorized. But you know the government of the day does have a say. You know, no institution except perhaps the Supreme Court is you know. What if Parliament passed an act? Yeah, uh, but yeah, that they could. As of now, the superintendents and running of elections by an act. Uh, under the Representation of People Act is with the Election Commission. Mm -hmm. But I guess the government could, yeah, you're right. But it hasn't been challenged since you study the Supreme Court. Has the duration been challenged well, the duration as unfair or giving... Actually, it hasn't, you know. Yeah. You're planting ideas, and I'm sure someone <laughs> might. Because right, I mean, if you're... If well, India has a thing called, a, uh, thing called a public interest education. Sure, of course. It's Breaking news, East-West Center challenges... <laughs> East-West well. East Center takes no policy... <laughs> 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 for the record and for the camera, let me be very clear. We offer ideas. Does it rotate the regions that go through the election? That's what Does I was asking. Every region go first every election? No. Does it rotate? No, no. Is it mandated? I mean, no, nothing of that. <coughs> what happens is, you know, say a state like Uttar Pradesh, which I mentioned, uh, which has a population of 220 million people, you know, it's three or four you know, more countries ruled into one, right? That's just one state. So that you know always has an election conductor over multiple phases. So the idea is that usually it starts from the eastern part of the state, it would start from the west too. But yeah. uh, sorry, it starts from the west and moves east. east yeah. And this time it's the eastern UP that the Prime Minister was and the last time too was conducting his 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 constituencies from the east of UP. So that was right at the end. So it kind of also gives them a little mm. bit of a advantage there. But the troops, the, the security forces sort of move from face to face from the east to the west. So uh, it's not that it's mandated which state goes to election when and that can change. But the big states will generally have you know, multiple phases. Um, but even smaller states like you know, the state that I mentioned, the West Bengal, uh, because of ostensibly law and order issues, also had a seven-phase election. Even the West Bengal is, you know, not even one fourth, probably one eighth the size of Uttar Pradesh in terms of size. Population wise, it's it's fairly heavily populated, but uh, there are, you know, so that had a multiple phase election. There are fairly large states like Tamil Nadu in the south of India, which had a one phase election. So there's, you know, there's probably, you know, more to them just sort of science of elections, you know, going into, you know, how this mm -hmm. thing is decided. But there is no consistency in the way, you know, each election or you know, where the elections are going to be, that can change. But the constant is that large states like Uttar Pradesh will always have a multi-phase. But they can change based on whoever's in power? When you say that uh, can change, I mean, who can change it? No, it's, it's really, again, as I said, the election commission, but I would say the government of the day does have. But, but is it the central government or the state government? The central government. The state, state government has yeah. no rule. <laughs> He's going to be around a little okay. bit afterwards, so <laughs> please. Chat, you're around a little bit, as yeah, I understand, sure. so your groupies can come and <laughs> <laughs> ask you further yeah, technical questions. But I'm afraid I have to close because, as I said, we're on a um, we're on a live stream. So I, I do want to try to uh, before we uh, thank uh, Rana Joy for this uh, talk. Let me just flag two things. If you're not on a must advertise. If you're not on our mailing list for events, publications, outreach, etc., please consider being so. We don't put anyone on our mailing list, but there's a Sign up form out there or leave your business card for us and we'll be happy to put you. Two other things I just want to announce because they're coming up in the next week, this week and next week. Um, tomorrow, it's tomorrow, right? Yeah. Tomorrow at lunchtime, um, a very able young um, a person uh, from uh, who's a Fulbright ASEAN scholar, worked in the presidential palace in Manila in the Philippines and is now heading the Philippine American Educational Foundation, which as you know is the Fulbrights, is coming here to speak on the US-Philippine Alliance, and that's over lunch tomorrow. Uh, Julio Amador is a very well worth listening to, but he, it will be off the record tomorrow um, because he wants to speak freely. And then on the 29th, 
Uh, Ms. Ivy Kwek, who's in the uh, Prime Minister's uh, Ministry of Defence Office in Malaysia, is going to talk about the first ever in history Malaysian Defence White Paper, uh, which could be quite an interesting uh, analysis into how small countries in Southeast Asia are responding to the kind of global competition or strategic competition, whatever you want to frame it as. So Ms. Ivy Kwek will be here. Um, so uh, please consider joining us for those or circulate to your colleagues who might be interested. As usual, it's an absolute pleasure to listen to you. And you. Um, uh, I realize that the election results are coming out the 23rd, but we couldn't arrange it for you to come after the elections to tell us. So we will have you back on your next trip. And um, good luck with the project on constitution, uh, on the parliament, on the Lok Sabha. And maybe you'll be soon filing a case in the Supreme Court <laughs> to, to uh, address the duration issue. Yeah. But really, Ramajar, pleasure to see you. And thank you so much for a terrific talk. Thank you.